if people are writing something purely for profit, they're going to burn out a lot faster than people who are writing something for fun. It is my absolute pleasure to have Janelle Loy with us here today. Janelle is the creator of Newsletter OS, a hugely innovative and very successful sort of hybrid between a, a book and information product and a digital dashboard. She created it in only 150 hours and its revenue, its royalties have been terrific. Very useful, very recommendable. I bought it, I loved it, and I can't wait to learn from Janelle about how she thinks about the positioning, the pricing, the process, and what allowed her to create such a great product so quickly. You're gonna love this. I actually created a version of newsletter operating system for myself. So newsletter operating system is the name of my product. And I actually really wanted to organize my newsletter when I was creating it last year. Last year, I started um, writing a newsletter and like anyone who's new to any field, you need to search a lot and figure out how you want to start your welcome emails, what platform do you want to use, who is your target audience and stuff like that. The newsletter space is pretty well developed, but like newsletter writing at a personal level doesn't have enough resources yet. What I did, I was like basically ran all over the internet, talked to people and scraped everything together into one document just for myself. And I called it the Brain Pine OS. It just lived in my Notion. And if you don't already know what Notion is, Notion is this like software where you can actually use as like a personal wiki. I think that's the best way to um, describe it, but it's like an all-in-one workspace where you can keep documents, you can keep files, you can keep data and things like that. If you have used Evernote, you, you would say like Evernote on steroids. Everyone that I know is using Notion these days, but it's something that more and more people are familiar with. So yeah, I've basically created this product for myself. And one day I thought, hey, it's pretty valuable. Why don't I sell it? And that's like the genesis story behind my product. When we talk about pricing, I really didn't know whether people were going to buy it or not. So I actually did a silly thing and I sold it for $10. And $10 is probably like a, an okay price for a book. But mine wasn't really a book. The reason why I created Newsletter OS is I wanted to make a resource that was actually valuable. I did think about making a PDF or making some sort of long form uh, thing, but I thought, hey, people who write newsletters are not going to want to have a sort of static document. They're going to want to have something that they can click into. They want to add their own information and stuff like that. So yeah, I started selling it off as $10 just because I didn't know the demand for it. And the $10 uh, thing sold out immediately. Almost immediately, I was having my dinner and then poof, it was gone. Then I raised it to $15 and I left it at $15 for quite a long time. I had quite a lot of imposter syndrome when I started. So I was like, no one's going to buy this if I'm going to raise my price. Like no one. But hey, you never know until you try, right? And actually, I just left it there uh, at $15 for a very long time. During this time, I was working my product and I was putting a lot more stuff into it. Still relatively low work count and as the final product. But when you think about all the different steps about writing newsletter and things that you want to consider, it was a lot of information and like much more than anything that existed on the internet in one single place. So that was like the value proposition. And I started showing it to my friends um, who were like beta users. I always believe that you should actually show your product to like some people before you release it. If not, you can just promote a dot or like launch a dot and then you're just going to fail. So I always like to have eyes on my products. So my friends were like, why are you selling this for $15? This is way too cheap. And I was like, no, I again told them, hey, uh, if I raise my prices, no one's going to buy it. And they said, no, um, you should just try and raise it to at least like $29 or $30. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I raised it. And funnily enough, people continued to buy. And then I raised it again to 39 and then I raised it again to 49 and people continue buying to this day. Um, I don't even promote it anymore. I don't even know where the people are coming from sometimes, but I'm selling like maybe one or two copies a day without doing any promotion. But that's a pricing I mean, that, story. That's a good result. That's a few grand a month as yeah. pure passive income. And I'd assume if it follows the performance of what I've seen with my books, the more people who buy it, the more people will buy it because it fuels yeah. the recommendation loop. And something I loved about the way you wrote it, I was showing my screen a, a minute ago, but you show up and there's no justification. You're not saying this is why you should start a newsletter. You're just saying, I know you want to, here's how to do it. And because of the way you built it, it's straight into like, okay, you need to make this decision. Who's it for? You need to make this decision. What's your tone? These are the tools you can use. It's fiercely practical. Did that come naturally to you or was that something you had to work toward? Because like I bought it, not because we were doing this interview. I bought it months ago because I wanted it. I was happy to pay the $49. I thought that was a deal. Yeah. How did you get to this point where you got rid of all the fluff 
it's normal to business resources. I'm not really a fluffy person. I'm very practical. Whenever I give a talk or a presentation, I always want to make sure that there are actionable takeaways. And I think that's the philosophy of how I approach my product. The thing is that people who aren't newsletter writers wouldn't have bought that product. Or if even they weren't mo- remotely interested, they wouldn't have bought it, especially at this current price point at $49. Like, why are you going to pay $49 if you're not actually interested, right? So I think that weeds people out. And I'm very clear in my landing page, in my copy. When I first started selling my product, I didn't even have a proper landing page. It was just like a gumroad page. So I think like copy is more important than having a, a snazzy landing page. So yeah, that's just my view though. I think that's probably maybe the biggest thing. I built Brain Pine OS for myself. So I've been storing all these little snippets over the months that I have created my newsletter. And I just didn't see the point in adding more fluff, I guess. <laughs> and also there are some people who have written like really long articles on different parts of writing a newsletter. So instead of adding fluff, why don't I just um, save myself the time and actually like point to, to their stuff? Uh, because maybe they write it even better than I do. And why reinvent the wheel when people have already written about it? And also I help to drive traffic to their site. It's a nice thing about the digital format because you do include a lot of links and references and I appreciate that. Whereas when I read those in a physical book, it's a bit frustrating or I want everything to be included. Do do you feel like you missed out on not releasing a paperback also? Because on the one hand, Newsletter OS is fundamentally a digital product. Like it relies on the links, it relies on the to-do list. Do do you regret this? Do you have a a view on the paperback or the, the physical distribution? I think no, because I've never intended it to be like a paper book. I've Mm. always intended it to be actionable. So I don't really see, just from my point of view, I don't really see how they might be putting in their data into a physical book. So that's like the part that I'm thinking maybe not. But if I had more time, maybe I would have written a guide for writing and starting a newsletter, especially now that the newsletter uh, space is heating up with uh, all the acquisitions and like Twitter moving in and stuff like that. But I think at the moment, I'm happy with it. And I see that there's still the opportunity for anyone who wants to um, write a guide to starting a newsletter to start one, but definitely not like a full scale book, like newsletter writing a guide for dummies and it's 200 pages because that's just too much information now for people who maybe are feeling like content overload. The value per page was unbelievable. And I also saw that quite recently you released an updated version and yeah. that's something that's quite easy to do with it, with a digital version. It gives you that luxury. It's something that always frustrates me with paperbacks. It's like, ah, there's new knowledge. I want to put it out there. And it's such a chore. Paperbacks also have their virtues. Uh, I love them. I'm going to continue doing them, but I love what you did. And it was so in a way brave to decide like it's not a paperback because people hate that. You get an email and they say, when's the paperback coming? Or when's the audiobook coming? It feels terrible to say never. Yeah. And I, I love that you just said, no, this is how my book is best. It's best yeah. digitally. Deal with it. That's my scoping. Yeah. I don't even know how to position it because like <laughs> when I first wanted to release it, I was trying to think of how I was going to tell people what it was because it's like a book. It's like a dashboard. It's like A guide is like, I don't know, it's like a course also in some senses, but I just decided to call it an OS then. So it's like operating system, like everything you need to write a newsletter and start one. And then now I see operating systems popping up all over the internet, like in the way that I've created like a newsletter OS. It's it's been quite interesting to see and very fun actually. It's a brilliant metaphor. And I I don't know if you're willing to share numbers. I won't press you for them, but certainly I've seen a few public blog posts that said your launch did brilliant financially, cruised past $20,000 quite easily, and it's done great since then. You've obviously done something, right? Okay, I can share a number. So when I first launched it in the pre-order phase, it wasn't like a lot of money because of the problem of pricing. So actually your pricing makes such um, a huge difference for your product. You can sell um, 100 copies at $10 and you can sell 20 copies at $50, right? It's the same amount of money. By the time I launched on Product Hunt, which was about one month after I launched my pre-orders, I I hit $10,000. And then after that, I've chugged on from there. Some days that that I had sales, I got like more volume in. So that was good. And today I'm at $32,000 for Newsletter OS. And for my other product, which is Podcast OS, I've crossed the $8,000 uh, mark with about 200 plus sales. And oh, Newsletter OS, I have 800 plus sales. And with Podcast OS, I've just earned a lot more per product because I raised the prices from the start. 
And then I also closed an enterprise deal with uh, Podcast OS, people buying bulk license. And that's actually been really good for myself and my partner. So yeah, like the whole OS thing, it has been like really lucrative. I don't really like to share numbers publicly on Twitter anymore these days without context, uh, without the larger story. But like here is like perfectly okay because like it shows the journey. Right. Amazing. And what's also incredible about that is that this is a part-time on the side thing for you. You're busy. You've got a startup you're working with. You're doing a million other things. So it's not like you're spending all day getting to market and hustle these. And also you wrote them quite quickly. I don't completely remember, but I, I seem to recall seeing in a blog post or an article or an interview that you created this product very quickly and it still had success that exceeds almost every traditionally published nonfiction book. How did you actually make this? How long did it take? What was the process like? My official number for Newsletter OS in terms of hours taken, I peg it at about 150 hours, which I think compared to writing a book is a lot less time. You guys all are writing like amazing content rich books and I'm like, poof, 150 hours, like boom, product is out. I think that I took 150 plus if you consider the whole like marketing of it and stuff like that. And there's also all these hours that I haven't counted when I've been making this product for myself. I think like all together before I consider like the whole like making of landing page and like product hung launch and like any um, other deals I'm trying to stitch up, it's been at least 150 hours officially, maybe about 200 hours. I announced the pre-order like sometime close to the end of October and I already had the actual product out in October 30th. So it was like only 11 days just because I wanted to launch the product before October. It was like a funny thing because I am a part of this program called Launch MBA and we, we launched like one product every month, like for 12 months, we are supposed to do that. Not supposed, but highly encouraged. And I was like, yeah, newsletter always is my October launch. So I need to launch it before October. That's why I actually didn't spend that much time. But I spent a lot of time obsessing over the architecture of the product. Because if you create something in Notion, even though you can update it a little bit more easily than actual physical book or digital book, there's a lot of things that you probably don't want to mess around with. So I just had to make sure that the base was solid. I wish I could put out a book in that amount of time. That's about 10 times faster than I can manage. So who's got questions for Janelle? I do. You said that you have done an updated version. If you already have bought it, do you get the updated version? Is it as a service? Is there a subscription? How does that work? The way I market my product and the promise that I give to my customers is that whenever I'm going to add extra details, they are going to get an email. And in that email, I'm going to give them a Notion page. So I'm going to give them a website with details and stuff that I put into the product that they can copy over and put it into their dashboards. So think about it as like a dashboard, right? And then like dropping new links or new bits of text into the dashboard. And I call it the change log. There'll be extra information and sometimes there'll be some extra deals that I add. I have this thing called a toolkit as well, where I share like some of my favorite writing tools or newsletter writing tools. And that kit is more than 130, 140 tools long now. So sometimes I would just add five more tools to the toolkit and things like that. So yeah, what I do is I send that email out with that change log. And I also update the actual version, the actual digital version. And I put the date below. Let's say tomorrow someone else comes and buys the product. They will get the updated version already. Cool. Thank you. We got a lot of members who are in different time zones and they're not here. So I have to ask this question on their behalf, which is how in the sweet fudge did you grow so quickly from nothing to like, you know, Oh, you mean a, on Twitter? A huge audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for context, if you don't know uh, my story yet, I think in June or July last year, I had like less than 50 followers and I had like 30 something followers. And then now I don't know how much I have. I think I just crossed 8,000. I think that growing on Twitter, there's no magic behind it. It's really showing up, writing good stuff, commenting on other people's stuff. And I think amplifying others as well does help. I think there's a really good formula to growing on Twitter. And that's really firstly being interesting. So writing interesting stuff, doing interesting stuff and saying interesting stuff. If you feel like you have nothing interesting to say, which I think your group doesn't have a problem with because you're all writers, then summarize other people's work. Summarize interesting conversations that you're having. And uh, also, if you are writing a lot of long form, try to atomize that content and make 
tweet threads. I think those like really help to grow. And if you are good with graphics, try to bring some like graphic elements to your writing. So I think you really need to try to be interesting by letting your personality shine through. So it's not enough to just tweet like smart sounding things, be yourself, and then you will find your tribe. So you will like attract like-minded people to yourself when you're just like sharing your ideas with the world. Another thing that I always say is be interested in others have conversations in the DMs, have conversations with people that you're interested in learning from, and always make sure that when you're DMing people, you are, oh, DM is direct message, so that little mail icon Twitter thing, just in case. Make sure that you're always complimenting their work and like sharing something that you can give value to their life instead of just like asking them a whole essay long of, hey, I wrote this long thing, I'm from this place, please give me your opinion, right? That's not the way that you make friends in real life. You make friends by introducing yourself, like, sharing some common interests and stuff like that so just bring the way that you make friends in person online to twitter and that's i think the fastest way to grow just lifting each other up if you are growing within this group find ways to amplify each other find ways to find friends that even outside of your bubble that you can amplify and help each other grow as well i think that's like an interesting way to approach growth and so, i think that consistency as well outside of twitter or Actually, maybe more generally, I know attribution is sometimes difficult. It's tough to tell where exactly a sale came from. For me, Twitter is responsible for approximately 0% of my sales, wow. as far as I can tell. And almost everything comes from individual recommendations where someone has a problem and they go, ah, this book is the answer. And I've tried really hard to track it down over the years. And as far as I can tell, I do Twitter for fun now, not for business. Yeah. Do you have a sense of where it weighs in or where the different proportions of sales come from? Are you running a newsletter? Is it all word of mouth? Was it all product hunt and then referrals from there? How does this break down? What drove the majority of it? I am a marketer, so I should actually know this more and I should know the details like like that, right? But I don't. I know that most of my referrals honestly come from Twitter. So like, Twitter is like a big growth engine for me. I also get a lot of sales from uh, recommendations, as you mentioned. I know my friends or my customers are like shouting me out in their different communities. So I'm like really thankful for that. Also get a few sales from paid communities that I'm in. It's actually really interesting because some of the most engaged customers that I've found have been members of the paid communities that I'm in, and I'm quite active in some paid communities. Obviously, not just the one that I'm working in, which is on deck, but things like Visualize Value and Trends.vc and things like that. If you're an active member, and it doesn't even need to be a paid community, it can even be like a Facebook group that's free. So long as you're providing value on a regular basis, people will actually notice you. And then like when you do post your stuff, it converts into sales. I don't know if I have really gotten a lot of sales from uh, Google Organic, and that's actually something that I want to work on and like get more granularity into the data. But yeah, I think like Twitter, also indie hackers, and word of mouth and paid communities has really driven my sales. I, I always see the Google and the organic stuff as the long term play. Like once you know the product's working, you can justify investing in that stuff and building out the yeah. content, but it's slow. You know, sometimes it takes yeah. months or years to come back to you. So it, it's not how you start a product. I like the way you approached it. So you've seen also a lot of other authors. What do you think are the mistakes that people are making when they sit down to write something or create an info product that prevent them from finding success and finding revenue? I think the first thing is not actually understanding what their target audience wants or needs. So then I need to ask them to read the mom test. <laughs> Also, like beyond not understanding why uh, or what the target audience wants, like it's not even understanding who they're writing it for and why they're doing it. If people are writing something purely for profit, they're going to burn out a lot faster than people who are writing something for fun. Like for me, it's like totally been just for fun at first. And then now I'm taking like a more business approach to it. But it has always been for me a product that enables me to get a path to inspiring other people to write newsletters and start their own things. Doing things like just for profit, that's like a mistake. Uh, although it's not 100% bad, like you can do things for profit, but you just need to know that you're doing it for profit and that like you need to like steal yourself with like more willpower to see it through, I guess. It's just not the way that things work for me. What else? I, I did this funny thing called Mythbusters in a presentation that I did recently and I, I think also following other experts' advice blindly is another big problem. Let's say whatever I say today, you decide to follow it to the T. Maybe it doesn't work for your audience, right? So don't follow my advice. You know your audience the best. Another thing is that sometimes customer feedback, I shouldn't take it to heart. 
some writers or info product um, owners or creators go and have these conversations and then they meet one like really crazy customer or a customer that's just not in their target audience and not it shouldn't be their target audience and then they feel like hey, this guy actually makes sense and I should change my product hugely just because of what one guy said. And maybe if it's just one person, you shouldn't take it to heart because if it's something that you've heard like multiple times, then yeah, you should see and investigate whether there's actually a problem with what you're creating and your message is not resonating with them. I think about that a lot. When I get beta reader feedback, someone says, I hate this or this offends me or I'm super confused. And I care because I don't want lots of people to get confused, but I'm not going to blindly obey one of their suggestions. I, I try to understand where's this person coming from. Like there, there was someone recently who was a traditional publisher and they, they read my, my current book and they got annoyed because I'm, you know, not the most positive about traditional publishers, but also I could tell from their feedback that they were violently skimming. They must've gone through the whole book in about 10 minutes. So it's like, okay. I'm not blindly obeying the suggestions. I'm trying to understand where did these issues come from? Yeah. And then how do I, as the product designer, want to change my product, yeah. uh, which sounds like you, you yeah. use the same approach. I feel like a lot of people get tripped up on bad customer feedback when they shouldn't, or they might feel like scared or sad about their product because it's human, right? It hurts you when someone says something bad about your product. And uh, it used to hurt me when I get like weird refund requests. And uh, after doing it for so long and actually seeing like the positive feedback about my product, I don't really get that scared about bad customer feedback anymore because bad customer feedback goes on two spectrums. Some people actually write to me and say, hey, I could have Googled this in five minutes. And I'm like, no, you couldn't have but then I refund them anyway. And then there are some people who say, hey, your product is too complicated. Like, so who are you going to listen to, right? Because there's obviously two very opposing views and you just need to pick which one you believe in and talk to your most targeted customers and know that's enough for them or know ways that you can improve it for those people who advise and like feedback you actually really rely on. There's a very common trap in beta reading where the first beta readers that we often ask to look at our work are the people we know who are most experienced in that industry. But of course, we're normally not writing for the most experienced people. We're normally yeah. writing for amateurs. And so our first beta reader who we're exposing our heart to the most is not actually representative of our real readers. But because it's the first and it's your only feedback at that point, we overvalue their success. And it can end up really swinging the direction of your book around in a way that's not actually correct for your final readers. It's something that's tough to deal with. When I had my beta readers, I made sure that I had them from like very different categories. So I told myself, I need one who is an absolute beginner who hasn't started a newsletter. Then I need at least one person who has written the newsletter and has like X amount of subscribers. And then like maybe someone who has a bigger newsletter. And then for my product, just because it's an interesting product, it's not actually like a book book, right? It's not like a physical book or a digital book. I needed to make sure that I had people who were newbies, like hadn't used Notion before because I'm used to it and I know how to use it like inside out, but maybe others don't. And I also was very careful about that in the sense that I actually wrote stuff on like, how do you even use notions? Like how do you use the toggles? How do you use different parts? I even did a configuration guide on how you actually configure a book. And that's not something that you would probably do with a paperback. So I think that's like something interesting. I think if you cover like the different parts of the spectrum in terms of like experience levels, when you write your book, you're going to get like a lot better and like more well-rounded feedback. Some people say it's too complicated for them and I totally understand like maybe they feel overwhelmed by all the different tabs. Maybe they're used to reading linearly because my product is like definitely not linear. It's like a choose your own adventure, right? You go inside and then you're like, oh, this part uh, makes sense to me. And I sometimes tell people like you can skip these parts. Maybe these parts are not going to be useful for you right now when you're starting off. But as you become more advanced, then you might want to look into it. It's a choose your own adventure kind of thing. And I always tell mm -hmm. people like don't stress out because you feel like you don't understand one part. I try to dummify it as much as possible and also include links to other resources in terms of technical stuff. And I make sure that my positioning on my landing page says that, hey, even if you're a total newbie, I've really given you like the guide and like the resources to follow on. It was quite a unique experience for me as a customer because I read a lot of business books. I read a lot of skill building books. And this was, you know, this is the homepage. Okay, this is what it does. It's going to help me create and run a newsletter. I need that in my business, right? The value proposition is clear. And then once I got it, it it's straight in there. This is the entire introduction. You know, what is this? Three sentences? 
this is the introduction. Then after that, it's like, start doing stuff. It, it's links to actions. It's like, what do you care about? Do you care about growth? Do you care about getting started? It's very interesting way. And if I'm being honest, I probably only read 20% of it. However, that was the 20% I needed. And I was delighted to have spent the $50 to get that piece of it because that was what unlocked me. I wasn't looking for two hours of leisure reading. I was looking for a solution to my problem. And that's exactly the spirit that I think the useful book is trying to accomplish. It's, it's great if you can write beautiful prose, but more importantly, is can you solve the problem for the reader? I love the way Janelle approached it. It was just getting rid of all the garbage straight to the value. Mm, so nice. Uh, and yeah, I paid her two and a half times as much as I would pay for a normal book. And it was well-deserved. I'm so curious, which part unlocked you? Personally, it's very much like weekly process and also the tools. There's a million tools that exist for this. And I wanted someone to say, these are the five best tools. And I wanted someone to say, there's a million ways you could spend time on this. Here's a repeatable weekly process. And I got that and I was happy. And uh, I've been sending out my newsletter every week, more or less, so with RJ's help sometimes since buying your product. So for me, like that was the result. I wanted to send a newsletter every week and now I can. We, we talked to April Dunford about positioning recently and she talked a lot about, and also Alex Hillman talked about this. He's like, if it's a short book, describe its value in terms of saving time because then people are happy that it's short. And so I, for me, the dashboard framing set that expectation where I wasn't surprised after I bought it. When you're building your next one, would you do things differently? What would you change between the first and the, the future products? So I did build my second product, which is Podcast OS. And what I changed is the pricing, like heavily. And also I leaned more on experts because I was writing something that I don't even know much about. Okay, now I know because I've like spent 100, 200 hours on that. I know how to make a podcast and I probably won't make one. But yeah, leaning on like the expert networks of like my friends, my partner, Josh Copland, who used to run the podcast of Morning Brew, really having a strong partner and knowing that you have a partner who can bring expertise to you. And then my role in that product was ensuring that everything was like nice and orderly and we didn't commit the curse of knowledge. What the curse of knowledge is, is that you're an expert in some field and domain. And then you think that everyone knows everything that you already know about the product and like you're trying to explain it in like complicated ways. It's like when you start talking in acronyms about stuff or just assuming that people know something when they actually don't. I think that there's a big problem that a lot of experience creators have and even people in big organizations they just assume people know what they're talking about i think there's a lot of ways to combat that and it's how, important how did you deal with it for podcast OS, i was a noob i knew what i didn't understand and i made sure that my partner explained it properly for newsletter os i gave it to the newbies and i say hey is there anything that's confusing is there anything you don't understand and in notion is very easy because all i needed to do was to give them a copy of it and they would just log in with their accounts and like comment on it it's like your book review software but a lot easier and more dynamic and they can even put in their own content as well which is really helpful these people are paid customers or they are people that are, are experts in the field that i actually trust so with that, I actually changed the way I dealt with it, just collecting all the information for newsletter OS by myself. And I had parts of it where my friends helped out, but that was like very few. That was like maybe 10%. And at the end parts where I felt I really, really needed someone to check my work. But in Pod OS, it was more collaborative. I got more people to contribute and then I gave them shout outs and things like that. I think getting more collaboration in for the product, but also knowing when to cut it off because you have your own deadlines and things like that. And sometimes people who promise you stuff are not going to deliver. So you need to be aware that you should set the deadlines earlier or you should have some backup plans in case people are on time and if you're working towards a really strict deadline. But in the case of, for example, my product, I can update it anytime. So it doesn't really matter, but you always want to jump out of the door with like your best product, right? You don't want to jump out of the door with like a half big product and then you tell people, hey, I need you to update your entire thing. And people are like, what? I already spent like 10 hours putting in my podcast details or putting my newsletter details into this uh, thing. And then you're asking me to like throw that out and like put in a new thing no like people will be mad but if you're doing small incremental changes then they'll be happy about it and then they see hey you're putting in the effort to actually improve your product on a quarterly basis or something like that the updates are technically possible with kind of kindle books and all of that but 
you really can't force it onto people who have already read it. I mean, for yeah. one thing, people only read the book once. So what they read is what they've got. But then on the other hand, if you force an update to the Kindle, which is technically possible, it deletes all of their notes and highlights, which just yeah. completely upsets them. So yeah. basically you can release new versions for new customers, but you never really have a way, at least if you sell through Amazon, to update it for your existing customers. You just don't have direct access to them. And it's something Alex Hillman talked about as well with Tiny MBA, where he left Amazon because he wanted to be able to directly contact his customers. And obviously you trade off certain scale and promotional benefits in doing that. But I do get envious every time I hear one of these stories about being able to just like someone received my book the other day and it had no glue in the binding. The pages were just like, it was just loose pages between oh, a cover and they left an angry review, but I can't even say sorry because I don't have their yeah. email. Like I would love to refund them. We called Amazon. Amazon's like, yeah, well, if they email us, we'll refund them. I'm like, they're not going to do that. They're mad. Yeah. You know, that's my only frustration. And it does make me envious when you have a direct customer relationship. Yeah, it's nice. A lot of my customers have become my friends. And I'm really thankful for that because I learned different things from them. Like, like what I alluded to, like in the beginning of our call, right? Like we all are in islands. There's so much that we can learn from each other. I teach them about newsletters. They teach me about other things in life. Jumping in real quick, Ole Peters from the London Mathematical Institute, about two or maybe three years ago, a topic that he worked a lot on, ergodicity, it really blew up. And one of the people I know, Luca, he made a, a Rome book on that. It's a little bit similar to your idea in the in the sense that it's non-linear. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. We also have a few members in our community who, uh, who are also using that Rome book approach. Do you think that's a market that's going to be growing over the following years? I know Rome is a Rome cult. I'm not inside the Rome cult, so I don't know how they really operate, but I know that there's definitely a demand for that. I do think that I've seen, I've been seeing an explosion in Notion products. So I'm not surprised if people start monetizing their Rome like information or like databases. I've tried Rome before and I think like Rome probably is really good for like network thinking. So I'm not so sure how useful a Rome book will be if it's not networked to the rest of your notes. I'm quite curious to see what a Rome book actually looks like now. But the good thing about having a, a Rome book is that you already have a captive audience that's willing to pay $15 a month for a productivity software. So you can definitely charge like $50 at least for your book. The nice myself. thing about any useful book is that people are buying it for a problem. And if someone yeah. has a problem in their life, they're paying money to solve it. And doubly so if it's a business problem, like Kate's writing about business communication, if yeah. you can save them an hour of time, that's a steal from their perspective, right? Something that I thought about earlier on was that why don't you supplement your paperback books or digital books with some sort of OS and charge a premium for a bundle? I think that would be an amazing idea because a lot of your books are actually actionable, right? But they are like written as a guide. But what if you put a guide and like an extra resource? So then you can sell your resource on your own website, get full margin on that. And then you can even lead with your resource and use it as a lead magnet for your book even. Just need creativity, which you all have. So I'm um, excited to see what you create. Ooh. I love it. And that also solves the Amazon customer relationship problem. Because if you have this wonderful digital add-on, which is on your website, and people have to put in their email to get it, then that allows you to reach out to your customers and it's crazy how this changes the profitability. Janelle mentioned the difference between charging $10 and $50, but it's unbelievable. It's so much easier to double your price than to sell twice as many books. And yeah. if you can find a way to justify that doubling of price where people feel like it's valuable and authentic, there's no better adjustment you can make to your business strategy. And then also people take it seriously. When someone gives you a book and they're like, read this, you're like, I'm skeptical unless they're a real trusted friend. It's just some person on the street, read this book. You're like, I don't think I will. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me ask you a couple bullet questions, real quick questions, quick answers, okay. and then we'll thank you and let you go. So. What advice would you give to someone who's having trouble getting started and doing the work? Just start. Uh, <laughs> um, just start and surround yourself with amazing people who will help you and encourage you when you get stuck. What about someone who's having trouble getting finished and putting it out there? They're doing the work, but they're scared to share it. Same advice. Surround yourself with um, amazing people. Show it to them and get their thoughts. Obviously, in your community, I'm sure that you have honest feedback between different groups and different people, right? If you have that environment and you're a part of it and you're active in it, then it doesn't become so scary when you're receiving feedback from other people. 
What's the most overlooked or underappreciated marketing tactic or option for authors? Building an audience. <laughs> and if you had the chance to advise yourself when you were starting to write Newsletter OS, is there any advice that you would give yourself in retrospect? Um, don't be afraid to price higher. <laughs> Amazing. Well. Thank you so much, Janelle. Uh, how can we help you? Where can we learn more? Uh, what's the right place to go if people want to learn from you? Cool. Um, I'm followable on Twitter at Janelle, J-A-N-E-L-S-G-M. And um, I write a weekly newsletter that's called Brain Pint. So brainpint.com, like pint is in ice cream pint or pint of beer. <laughs> and then um, my product is Newsletter OS, which you can find at newsletteros.com or podcastos.co. Yeah. I'll include all the links below the video. And thank you so much, Janelle. Thanks, it's Rob. been an absolute Thanks, pleasure everyone. here. And I look forward to catching up in person someday soon. Yeah, we get it. your pricing makes such um, a huge difference for your product. You can sell um, 100 copies at $10 and you can sell 20 copies at $50, right? It's the same amount of money.